All right, welcome back to the big picture. My next guest is Congressman Jeff Fortenberry. He's a Republican who represents the 1st Congressional District of Nebraska. Tweets at Jeff Fortenberry. Congressman, welcome to the show. Hey, great to talk to you. Thanks for having me on. This is uh, the first question I ask most members of Congress when they come on the show, and it goes something like this. Uh, I've been to all 50 states. I would be surprised if I'd been to the 1st Congressional District of Nebraska. So would you please introduce us to it? Uh, well, uh, farm, family, and football. How's about, how about that for succinctness? <laughs> excellent. Uh, we are a great agricultural state. It is part of our tradition. It informs our culture. There are tight-knit urban communities here as well. It's a great place to live and work and raise a family. And, and uh, you know, that's a value that uh, is generally held by all Nebraskans, and we celebrate it. Excellent, excellent. Well, I'm, I, I do want to say, uh, my, my listeners, even if they don't immediately know your name, you took some big steps to counter a modern-day plague, the plague of robocalls. What, uh, what got you started? Well, first of all, I'm, I'm, I want to thank you for bringing this up, because as we lurch from moment to moment in whatever momentary drama there is in Washington, there are real people back home dealing with real issues that affect them day in and day out, and if there is an issue that can unite all of America, it is stopping the plague of robocalls. So I've talked about my, with my staff for a number of years about how we could get in front of this better. Uh, I have a pretty pro, uh, protected phone myself, but I even got a scam from Social Security through a ro- robocall call, and I knew what it was. But think about a person who might be in a more vulnerable circumstance, thinks Social Security is calling them, and they hit one and then give out their number. So these are not just annoyances. They're also scams that uh, affect real people. So we were able to get this through the Congress. The president signed it into law. The Federal Communications Commission now will have advanced tools to stop this pernicious practice. Uh, telephone companies are going to have to provide at no cost, blocking technology to customers, and there's enhanced penalties. And so it won't stop it, probably, but it's, it's a better enforcement mechanism that, than we now have. Government, it's hard for government to keep up with um, nefarious intentions of bad people. Yeah, I mean, I, I, a couple of years back, Congressman, I looked into the, the Do Not Call registry um, because I was, I was getting a lot of scam uh, a lot of scam calls, and I was wondering, geez, why isn't it working? And the, the biggest problem seemed to be that uh, modern-day scammers are going over the Internet and spoofing numbers. They're not using the traditional means to uh, to, to mess with people. Yeah, that that's right. And so, again, it, it government tends to lag in terms of technology and enforcement mechanisms for people who have bad intentions and are going to use it ever advancing technology to get around it. So, but this is a good step. It was a, look, I, I, I did a little poll in a telephone or in a town hall meeting I had. It's a hundred to nothing. Stop the robocalls. So yeah. it's, a, it's a unifying issue. I'm glad you brought it up. And it, it really is. Congress a unifying. And the president has not gotten any credit for this. So thank you again for raising it. It is absolutely, you're right. It is absolutely a unifying force. I mean, this is the one, this is one of those few things that everybody can agree has got to be stopped well we look again you asked me about nebraska we invented the phrase get her done i think most americans are very interested in the legislative process actually accomplishing something rather than just political drama all the time because it's exhausting the country and this is something specific that has been done and i'm, I'm happy about it I don't, I don't want to be sort of typical media and focus on focus on the conflict focus on the negative but was there was there any debate about the means or the ends when you were putting this together well, I, I, it, honestly, it took a long time to get through the Congress, and th- that's strange because it affects everyone. But nonetheless, um, I'm happy the Senate amended it. It came back, and anyway, it was basically the legislative process was used in a normal in a normal way. And um, again, the president signed it into law with little fanfare. I think we ought to celebrate this. It's a pretty good accomplishment because it affects so many people. Talking to Congressman Jeff Fortenberry, represents the 1st Congressional District of Nebraska, and tweets at Jeff Fortenberry. Uh, you mentioned a- agriculture being a big part of your, of your district. Uh, how does the USMCA trade agreement, which the president, I think, is going to sign this week, um, how, does, uh, how does this agreement change things for your district, if it does? Well, it continues to build upon the importance of fair and uh, good trade agreements with our neighbors to the north and south. Uh, NAFTA was old and stale and needed to be updated. We have lost a tremendous amount of manufacturing in our country. And frankly, the farm community is very interested in doing what's right for America. So while trade has expanded with Mexico significantly to basically build upon the, the good opportunities that happened earlier and reset some of the unfair aspects of this of, pre, of the previous trade agreement, 
um, and particularly in terms of manufacturing, it's good for all of Americans. So, uh, again, trade occupies an important place in the agricultural economy, and to reset and restabilize and make this fair for all three peoples was very important. I'm proud of President Trump for taking this on. There's a lot of naysayers out there, which are mostly multinational corporations that want to take advantage of lax environmental laws or lax labor laws, who say you can't ever change anything, but this was a good move, and it's never going to be optimal or perfect, but it was an update that made a lot of sense for the agricultural community and will help America, particularly manufacturing overall. Uh, forgive my ignorance, but when you talk about f- uh, farms and agriculture in your district, what, what are some of the main exports? Corn, soybeans, cattle, meat. Got it. Well, so cattle and so meat... Um, how much business do you guys do with China? Well, this is, look, the overall trade deficit with China is very significant. It's about 500 or so billion dollars, as I recall. Uh, soybeans is a big component of trade with, with China, and uh, that's important to us. Uh, we have a lot of hog production as well, and that's an important market to oh, us yeah. in China. Yeah, yeah. So um, we, we, it, it's important to try to get the trading relationship right with China, but China cheats. Um, they have stolen intellectual property. They have manipulated currency. They have lax environmental laws and lax labor laws. And again, you had this overseas shipment of manufacturing, uh, corporations that take advantage of our capital and our labor force and our know-how and our stability, and then move their operations overseas to take advantage of, uh, of how they can increase just quarterly profit without consideration of the purpose of profit, which is the well-being of persons and the well-being of community. And so for President Trump, again, to say this isn't going to stand, this is not fair, I agree with him. I'm glad he took it on. This is a good first step. It's obviously not complete, but something had to be done. So uh, hogs, you guys must be doing well, your district must be doing good business because the, the Chinese are importing a lot of American pork. Uh, yes. Soybeans, though, would be the other side of the, the coin, right? Soybeans has been an important market there, and it's, it's been hurt. Um, how hopeful are you that the, this so-called phase one trade deal will change the picture? Well, a, again, it's better than not having a phase one trade deal. It's a, it's a start. The significant trade gap is a huge problem for America. Uh, basically, we have a dysfunctional marriage with, with China. Um, they make the stuff, we buy the stuff, they have the cash, we run up debt, they buy our debt, and, and so this has got to be rebalanced. So you should have trade, you, should, you can have deficits in trading ranges, but they should be limited. They should reach caps and not be structural deficits on end, because what that is is a shift of the wealth assets of this country uh, into the hands of other people, and you can see what China is doing in terms of building up their military, in terms of this economic nationalism, uh, that is disrupting many places, particularly environmentally, particularly in Africa, but also in, in South America as well and throughout Asia. And they, they have to assume their place if they're going to be an economic superpower and a military superpower alongside the, the responsible nations of the international community and begin to, 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 to burden share, if you will. In fact, I asked Secretary Pompeo when he was before my committee recently, I said on state and foreign operations and appropriations, How much does China give in humanitarian aid? And he looked befuddled, and it was actually just a rhetorical question. I said, Mr. Secretary, I didn't mean for you to have to answer it. It, There's no answer. It's it's probably as close to zero as you can get. So this massive machine of an economy that just chews up resources and then has an unfair trade advantage with us had to be confronted. So it's an important market. We want to be in some kind of economic solidarity with China, but ensuring that it's fair. Talking to Congressman Jeff Fortenberry from the 1st Congressional District of Nebraska. You alluded to your membership on the uh, the Appropriations uh, State and Foreign Operations Subcommittee, which is where I was going to go next. I, I actually would love a formal administration answer to China's charitable giving, because my understanding from talking to other folks is that they have, they've really recently turned a corner and they've started to provide uh, more traditional-looking aid to countries, notably countries in Africa and in the Asian neighborhood. Well, I'd like to see that number as well, but um, I, I do have some mild indication of that myself. But the more that the, the, the consciousness of China can be raised, that they have a responsibility, for instance, not to uh, import endangered species, not to chew up resources, not to pay off bad people, not to use their own labor, but actually when they are engaged with other countries to create a regenerative ecosystem in which uh, the economy is benefited by local people, 
it enhances the understanding of uh, healthy nationalism, just doesn't pay off the strong man, and it doesn't deplete resources. This is not China's model, and if they're going to mature and take a responsible place, again, in international affairs, they have to move in that direction. They actually just took over the Food and Agricultural Organization in Rome, which was a shock. Um, again, one of the institutions that flowed out of World War II to try to create stability, food security and stability, along other organizations like the World Food Program, and China took over the helm of that. Um, I'm afraid America has been asleep um, in, in these realms. Uh, these are areas in which we've traditionally led, and China's making progress but in that regard, but it's not clear to me what their intention is. Congressman, are there things that the United States should be doing with regard to China that we're not? Well, I, again, confronting the trade deficit and the intellectual theft problem is, is very real. One day I was talking to a local manufacturer, and I said, you do China, any trade with China because they had a standardized product. He said, no, nope, um, we call their R&D ripoff and duplicate. <laughs> and this filters down to small-town Nebraska. And, again, they have a product that could easily be taken by the Chinese, produced in mass. So uh, it's, a, it's a real problem. They're getting a very bad black eye because of their, their own willful miscalculation about how to manipulate economic circumstances and the environment and use resource depletion just to fuel this massive economic machine. It's got to mature. They, their system has to be one that embraces economics. It's, a, it's an odd hybrid of communism and capitalism where you certain, create certain economic freedoms for people within certain limits, but no political or very limited political freedoms. And in the idea of human rights is sadly, sadly uh, lacking and, and abused. Um, so how do you reconcile all this? Well, it's this idea of this nationalistic economic movement, which is a behemoth, and it's very materialistic, and therefore it just chews up resources. It has to be fed. And this is a problem, because we're going to have to confront environmental realism, environmental sustainability in the 21st century. China doesn't have that model. Talking to Republican Congressman Jeff Fortenberry from Nebraska. Uh, th there is uh, some evidence that, uh, that, that the president's trade war has made companies shift their supply lines, uh, supply chains, uh, but they seem to be moving them to other low-wage, uh, low-labor, low-environmental standards. Is there a way to capitalize a little bit better on this? Well, you know, I've, I've actually, you remember about 15 years ago or so, one of our major corporations, I'll just say the name, Walmart, advertised, I think, 80% made in America. Well, I wonder what percentage it is now. You know, we have to have a movement in this country. If you want to do something patriotic, look at the label. Uh, these are your neighbors, your friends in other states, uh, possibly, who are making things with their own two hands, providing for their families trying to live up to the standards that we set up as Americans to ensure that people have rights in the workplace and that they have certain freedoms that are consistent with our values propositions. That's not the case in other places. This abstract notion of free trade just for free trade's sake is, a, is just a, an economic textbook. The reality is, in many places, manufacturing was decimated across this country in the last 20 to 30 years because of this, again, abstract notion of free, free trade. Look, I, in an earlier life, I lived for two years in Ohio. The, the, the town that I lived in lost 50% of its population from 40,000 or 100% down to 20,000 from 40,000. And this was the old industrial Rust Belt. And you can see the social consequences of that, the horrible trauma that is faced by communities when they don't have good work. So what we have now is one of the lowest unemployments in decades, close to 50 years. And part of that is due to manufacturing returning here. But corporate responsibility also demands that this country which creates a, it has a stable governmental system and laws of commerce that, that, that basically guarantee contracts, uh, creates the conditions and, and, and an educated workforce and a values-based workforce creates the conditions in which corporations can thrive. And there's a certain amount of patriotism, a duty that's owed to America when it's possible to make things here and not just simply exploit poor and vulnerable people elsewhere. Now, trade in of itself can be a good thing because it raises the boats of all people. In Central America, they make certain agricultural products better than we make them here in Nebraska. Well, if we can give them some corn and meat and hogs and trade for fruits and vegetables, well, fine. That benefits all peoples, but it, again, it has to be fair. But a lot of these corporations have taken advantage of, of the vulnerable around the world. And that's a, that's a conscious issue that, or an issue of conscience 
the shareholders and and I think we as a country need to, to take on. I'm, I'm actually glad you raised the issue because this is an important discussion. It is. I'll give you uh, just a, for a sense of scale. Um, I'm one of my small weird obsessions is uh, online presidential campaign stores, and as part of my research into that. Uh, I learned that in 2012, the Obama re-election campaign wanted to sell a basketball, right? Capitalizing on the, the president's fondness for the sport. And they learned uh, that you cannot buy a regulation-sized union-made basketball in America. Yeah, well, isn't that sad? And how hard can that be? And why is that? Uh, by the way, the, in the, the stores in the House of Representatives, it's all made in America. So come buy something in those stores. I don't think we sell basketballs, though. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think you do, but maybe there's a niche there. Um, we only have a, a, about a minute, so I won't, I won't uh, start a new topic. But I, do, I think if you haven't already seen it, I think you'd like the uh, documentary American Factory. I've not heard of that. Yeah, it's okay, uh, the uh, it's a auto plant shut down, um, later taken over by a large Chinese tempered glass company, and it's uh, it's about basically all the dislocations and the challenges to uh, to adjust. It's uh, it's it's worth see- it's it's worth seeing. I think it's on Netflix. I, uh, I I I watched it and I spoke to the two directors and I thought that it tackles a lot of the issues that you were just describing, which is why I'm recommending it. Well, look, there was a corporation that shut down, and there was a YouTube video that went out. And this is the last three years where a spokesperson comes to the floor shop and says, hey, this is a great team. We're still making stuff, but I've got some tough news. In a year, we're going to relocate down south. But don't worry. We've got a year. Everybody, you're a great team. Let's get back to work. Well, you can imagine the reaction from the shop floor. It's worth watching as well. That was a carrier corporation. I actually recommended that one of my chambers of commerce go to that, that outside of there and recruit people because we have plenty of jobs here. Congressman Jeff Hortonberry, thank you very, very much. I really appreciate it. Good to talk to you. That's all the time I have tonight for The Big Picture. My thanks to Ajara Filet and Jackson Sinnenberg for putting this together and keeping it on the rails. I'll be back tomorrow with more of the show. Actually, a really fun show tomorrow. I'm going to talk to someone, an expert on invasive species.